Good evening, everybody. My name is Christine Schmidt, and I'm the Deputy Director and Head of Research here at the Wiener Holocaust Library, and we are delighted to welcome you to tonight's event, which has been co-organized by the Wiener Holocaust Library, Yale University Press, and the Institute of Historical Research, the UK's National Centre for History, to mark the IHR centenary year. The Our Century program, which ran from July 2021 to May 2022, celebrates the discipline and practice of history across the UK and beyond. So we're delighted to have this opportunity to hear from four Yale University Press authors about their respective books or books in progress and their reflections on how the historiography or the writing of history of the Holocaust has changed. The panelists will also discuss how their scholarship will contribute to future directions in research on the Holocaust. Each of our panelists have approached various aspects of the history of the Holocaust and its legacies with the idea of expanding or questioning commonly understood narratives with greater nuance and complexity. For example, the enduring legacy of liberation, not as a single moment of rupture or the so-called end of the Holocaust, or the critical differences in the transnational memory of the kinder transport, or rethinking our understanding of child survivors' lives and how they understood their memories and experiences. So before I introduce our speakers, just a bit of the usual extremely boring housekeeping. Uh, for those of you who are attending here at the library, we are not expecting a fire drill. So in the case of, the, of a fire alarm sounding, please just exit the building uh, from the same uh, entrance that you came in. We only have one entry and exit, and then gather across the street um, while we wait for the uh, fire services. Um, if you need the toilet, those are in the basement, so you just have to go to the back of the uh, building and there's a lift that will take you down there. Um, our speakers, we're going to have about 20 minutes. Um, of course, two, two of the speakers are presenting together, so they'll have uh, 20 minutes for their joint pre presentation, and then we'll have time after for Q&A. Um, and for those of you online, um, please post your questions in the chat, and we will, um, of course, have some time at the end to take some questions from both our audiences online and, and here at the library. <clears throat> So now to our panelists, um, and I'll introduce everybody now so that we can just get right into the uh, presentations. Uh, Rebecca Clifford is Professor of Transnational European History at the University of Durham. She is the author of Commemorating the Holocaust, The Dilemmas of Remembrance in France and Italy, published by Oxford University Press in 2013, and Survivors, Children's Lives After the Holocaust by Yale in 2020. Dr. Amy Williams is currently working with Mitteldeutscher Verlag, Yale University Press, and Camden House to produce new books on the history and memory of the kinder transport. She is a part-time lecturer at Nottingham Trent University and recently appeared on the BBC series Great British Railway Journeys. She's currently working on a book with Bill Niven for Yale University Press called Kinder Transport, A Transnational Journey. Bill Niven is professor in contemporary German history at Nottingham Trent University he is the author of numerous books on memory of the Nazi period. His books include Facing the Nazi Past, The Buchenwald Child, published in 2007, and with Yale, Hitler and Film, The Fuhrer's Hidden Passion, published in 2018. He's just published a book in Germany with Mitteldeutsche Verlag on the post-war history of the Nazi film, Jud Suss. Dan Stone is Professor of Modern History and Director of the Holocaust Research Institute at Royal Holloway, University of London. He is a historian of ideas who works primarily on 20th century European history. His forthcoming books include Fate Unknown, Tracing the Missing, <clears throat> Tracing the Missing After the Holocaust, published by Oxford University Press, and The Holocaust and Unfinished History, published by Penguin Pelican next year in 2023. So without further ado, I would like to hand the floor over to our first speaker, who already has a microphone, but I will hand, hand this over to the next speaker. Okay. Keep this microphone and pass this mic. I yeah. have too much in my lap. <laughs> too much. I actually might very well have too much in my lap. Let's see if I can see if because I can't hold the microphone and I've got the book. Out. Thank you. I need it at some point. <laughs> Thank you. I'll stop horsing around. Um, <clears throat> hello, it's lovely to be here. I was saying to several of you before we started that haven't been to London since 2019 for reasons we all know about. And it feels very strange, actually. There are a lot of people everywhere and it's slightly freaking me out, but I'm very glad to be here. Um, <clears throat> and fully cognizant of the fact that there are many people here tonight from Yale University Press. And in fact, my editor is sitting right in the front row. <laughs> I wanted to start by reading you something from one of the reader's reports 
that I had uh, when, when this book, which is my most recent book, um, was in the proposal stage. <clears throat> And actually, the person who wrote it might very well be in this room. I don't know who it was. So they wrote the following. I read the outline introduction and first chapter you sent me. There is already a considerable literature on child survivors. So I approached this wondering whether the author could have much new to say. I'm convinced she does. So that was the last bit there that that was what enabled this book to be published. But I wanted to read that because I thought, you know, for Holocaust scholars in the room, this probably resonates with you. How many times have those of us who work in this area talked about what we're working on and kind of have it, you know, you have it met with this groan of, oh, not another book about the Holocaust. The field of Holocaust history has become so expansive. No PhD student could ever wrap their heads around the secondary literature primary sources have equally expanded, uh, exploded really, both in the sense that many new ones are being generated, if you look at oral history and, and memoirs, and also that there's a unique a new access to digitized documents. So we're kind of funny space in Holocaust historiography between a sense of fatigue, can there be anything new to say, and all the new possibilities opened up by these new documents. Or in other words, between a sense that there's nothing more that needs to be said and the overwhelming task of beginning to crack on with all that remains. At this moment in time, there are likely more historians working on Holocaust related topics than ever before. And yet, certainly in my opinion, there's no particular unifying themes or central questions that motivate this research. The earlier debates that so divided historians, such as the functionalism, intentionalism debate, have receded. I don't think they've really been replaced. Or perhaps you could say they've been replaced by a multipli multiplicity of smaller debates and questions. And when I wrote that, I thought, mm, is that a fragmentation? Which doesn't sound very good. Or is it more of a mosaic? I think in one sense, there's a lot of room for not just for different sort of work to be done in that kind of environment, but indeed for different types of scholars to enter the field. And I, I see myself in that way. So having said that, I want to speak to two themes that have greatly shaped my own work and not just this book, but actually all, all my work. Uh, the first is the theme of aftermaths and memory. And the second is the theme of narratives and becoming and being a survivor, but they're interconnected. This is where, this is where I need more table space. So I'm gonna do that. <clears throat> the Holocaust, this event that we seem to be both so tired of and so obsessed with, clearly did not end in any tidy way in 1944-45. So we might probe the question then, when did it end? From the perspective of survivors, which is the perspective that all my work adopts, 1945 represented less a clear end point and more of a descent into a extended liminal space between active persecution and kind of passive buffeting about that happened in the post-war world. What we have yet to fully appreciate as historians, I think, is the process and the consequences of survivors drift into a global diaspora. For example, for survivors of Bergen-Belsen, how did it feel to be liberated from that camp by British forces, only to find oneself effectively confined to a post-war DP camp on pretty much the same site? Or for those who survived by fleeing to the Soviet Union, who slowly trickled back into Europe in 1946 and 1947, what was it like to find yourself further cooling your heels in a DP camp in Germany? For those who tried to flee to mandate Palestine when the British refused to let significant numbers of survivors in, did it feel like liberation to find yourself interned in a British-run camp on Cyprus? <coughs> did liberation finally come with onward migration after the United States introduced the DP Act in 1948, allowing more significant numbers of survivors to emigrate after the creation of the State of Israel? For survivors on the move in a post-war world, 
A geographical settling was only one part of the slow process of post-war reconstruction. And having just worked with a bunch of visual historians on a paper about kind of um, visual aesthetics of post-war reconstruction, we really ended up thinking, you know, how deeply that is a euphemism in a lot of ways to talk about reconstruction. Because in all this movement, of course, threads, belongings, and identities were frayed and, and dropped and new ones were created. And underneath the persistent drumming of all that change and uncertainty was a question about loved ones. Where were they? Would they come back? This is why uh, in Survivors, um, so one, of the, one of the key things I wanted to do was start the story in 1945 and not before and take it straight through to the present. So that is what the book does. For very young child survivors, and they're the group I focus on in the book, that liminal period at the end of the war wasn't a brief and forgettable blip. It was the entire remainder of their childhoods. Consider this. In one care home for child survivors that I, I study, and it comes up a little bit in this book, and I'm actually, I thought it was such an intriguing case study that I'm writing my next book on this one specific care home. Orphaned children spent years not knowing what had happened to their parents, who ended up showing up alive with considerable frequency. The first living parent for this little group of, there were never more than 30 kids at this one care home. And uh, the first living parent was found in 1946, but the last one not until 1952. As I write in the book, this state of waiting forced children to live in a world of fundamental not knowing. Are my parents alive? Are they dead? until they effectively had left childhood behind. It was a state that continued. It was the terrible uncertainty of this post-war liminal state, as much as the events of the war itself, that shaped child survivors' relationship with their past as they moved through the rest of their lives. And in this sense, the question of aftermaths and the questions of, a question of memory are very deeply entwined. I think these issues are particularly pertinent at a time when conflict has returned to Europe. And as we all know, this is a conflict that is deeply affecting children. And in a moment when there are more children on the move as refugees globally than there were in 1945. With the Holocaust, we have needed to understand why it happened and how it happened and whose actions made it possible. And now we need to understand who, how those who escaped it went on with their lives how they made sense of their experiences, if they did, what their memories meant to them at different points in their life cycles. These questions are particularly difficult ones for very young child survivors because their memories and understanding of what happened to them during the war were necessarily patchy, not because they blocked it out, but because they were very small children. Indeed, this was the key issue that motivated me when I was writing the book. And here's where the lack of a desk is going to be a problem because I wanted to read you a quote from the book. But Christine said I have to make sure that I always hold the <laughs> microphone up to my mouth. So here we go. I think it's going to work. I won't be able to turn the page. <clears throat> this is the quote I wanted to read to you. Young children's experiences shed light on a question with profound repercussions. How can we make sense of our lives when we don't know where we come from? Because their pre-war memories were indistinct or even non-existent, and because there was often no living adult able or willing to fill in the key details of their earliest days and years, these child survivors often faced a decades-long struggle to assemble the tale of their origins, a simple but essential act of autobiography, fundamental to identity. If you cannot recount the story of your own family, your hometown, or your formative experiences, how do you make sense of your childhood and its impacts? What work do you have to do to explain who you are? Most of us take for granted that we can make at least some sense of our childhood memories. We do not often stop to think of this as a privilege. At its core, this book explores what it means to grow up and to grow older when you do not have that advantage and are forced by your circumstances to weave the story of your past from scraps.
I'm going to not drop anything. <laughs> I, maybe it came across a little bit in that quote, but I see this book and I actually see all of my work as being less about the Holocaust and more about making sense of the memory of, of genocide in a broader sense. And I don't want to universalize the stories of the children in the book. They're deeply rooted in their particular historical context. But I suppose that I see my work less through the lens of a Holocaust historian. In fact, I probably never really called myself that. And more through that of an oral historian who's fascinated by memory. And I think this different perspective has actually take, helped me to take my work in some different directions. And so let me say a little bit about the second theme, which is the theme of narratives and of being a survivor. What does it take for the world to see you as a Holocaust survivor? What does it take for you to see yourself that way? And what does it take for historians to be interested in your experience as a survivor? Holocaust historiography, if we think about it broadly, it's my little table there, um, has followed a bit of a strange path in this regard. From historians in the 1980s focusing on Nazi Germany and its implementation of the final solution, a vocabulary which we've largely dropped now. Through the 1990s, when we saw increasing numbers of regional studies, expanding our understanding of both perpetrators and bystanders. But the late comer in all this research was victims, a focus on victims and survivors, a turn that really only developed from the beginning of the 21st century. Historians had, I'm speaking really very much about historians here and not other types of scholars, they had what seemed at the time like good reasons for steering clear of the subjectivity of survivors' accounts. Although, of course, perpetrator and bystander accounts can be equally subjective. They found themselves constantly fighting the fires started by Holocaust deniers. And so they felt they had to respond by using the most emphatically objective sources they could. As a consequence, it took historians a relatively long time to come around to working with survivors' firsthand accounts. And again, this is true specifically for historians, not, for example, for literature scholars. It also meant that when historians did begin working in larger numbers with uh, what is often referred to as Holocaust testimony, for the most part, uh, historians missed or they didn't think to seek out the wonderful literature on the method and analysis of oral history that has developed since the 1980s. Indeed, these two fields, the study of survivors' accounts and the theory and method of oral history are really only just now coming together. I would say that, though, because I was trained as an oral historian, and that's probably what I'm most comfortable calling myself. Now, oral historians will tell you that oral sources are always primarily about subjectivity and memory. And as oral historian Alessandro Portelli tells us, they are as much about the time of the telling as the time of the event. One of the things I discovered in writing survivors is that the oral record of child survivors' accounts changed in many ways from the time that they began to feel they could call themselves survivors. And I have another quote that I want to read to you. This one does involve turning the page. So let's see how coordinated I am. And if I don't drop either the book or the microphone. <clears throat> so this is a story about, um, a woman named Felice Zed, who's one of the people uh, who appears in the book. In 1983, Felice Zed was only beginning to learn who she was. The year before, at the age of 42, she had finally received confirmation that her parents had been killed in Auschwitz. The family, Felice's parents, David and Lydia, her older sister, Beata, then aged three, and Felice, then one year old, had been deported from the little town of Waldern in the Baden area of Germany to the internment camp of Gurs in the south of France. The two small girls had been rescued from the camp by the Red Cross and hidden with French Catholic families until the liberation. Felice's parents were deported and murdered. Felice had been trying since her early 20s to trace the details of her own early years and her parents' lives and deaths, 
but there were still holes in her understanding. She struck up the courage to attend the first American gathering of Jewish Holocaust survivors, the largest meeting of Holocaust survivors ever held, which took, uh, took place in April 1983 in Washington, DC. Hoping to meet others with similar stories, but in certain where her own story fitted in the broader context of surviving the Holocaust. Felice braved the criticism of older survivors who told her, you were a child, so what do you know? You don't remember. Speaking with a volunteer who recorded a short interview with her at the gathering, Felice's frustration exploded. And so I, my sense is that there were literally volunteers sort of roaming the corridors of this big convention center, conducting on the spot interviews. That's the sense which you can listen to the whole collection at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And there's this sense of feeling in, in Felice's interview and certainly some with other child survivors, of, you can almost hear them saying, me, you really wanna to talk to me? Oh, well, okay then. So this is, this is what Felice said. People don't understand and it's very hard for me to talk about it. I don't belong. I didn't go to a camp. I didn't suffer in that way. There was nothing to show for it. I felt I'm not a survivor, but then I thought, well, I am a survivor in my own way. My parents died, my whole family died. And besides my sister and myself, everyone's gone. We now take a broad view of what constituted survival in the Holocaust and who might call themselves a survivor. But the accepted definitions were once far narrower. For many decades after the war, a survivor was understood primarily to mean a concentration camp survivor, a category that excluded the majority of child survivors and many adult survivors as well. The figure of the camp survivor had a cultural power that was reinforced by public opinion, but was also to some extent policed by camp survivors who were not eager to see those they imagined had suffered less dilute the potency of this notion of survival. Child survivors had to fight not only against the external criticism of older survivors, but also an internal voice that suggested that they were not really survivors, but just fortunate kids, that their war experiences were in some ways less authentic than those of camp survivors. It's only recently that child survivors have taken on some of the roles that not long ago were the preserve of older survivors. They often speak to school students. They volunteer at Holocaust museums and exhibits. They give talks for Holocaust Memorial Day. 75 years after the end of the war, they've finally been recognized as survivors. And there's a clear rationale behind the shift. They are the only ones left. But taking on this type of public role as a survivor, indeed as the last survivors, comes with a cost. And it's a cost that historians who engage with survivors accounts have to reckon with because our interactions with survivors bring with them certain moral and ethical complexities. Oh, I forgot I had this, oh, Never mind. I had a photo I wanted to show you. I describe it to you. It's one of the um, survivors I interviewed for the book. It's a wonderful photo of her standing uh, in front of an audience. She's just given a talk about her life story at the um, Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. And she's standing facing the camera and behind her is the audience, this massive hall filled with people and they're giving her a standing ovation and she's smiling. And I wanted to show it to you because I think when I saw it, it prompted the question, why do our audiences come in such large numbers to hear survivors tell their stories? Certainly in her case, um, she gives a lot of speaking events and I had a good look at how they are described. Those descriptions use language that is both universalizing and positivistic. Her story, this is Sylvia, so I'm sorry I couldn't show you her picture, I completely forgot about it until right now. Uh, her story was described as heartwarming, inspiring, uplifting, life affirming, Language that places a heavy burden on survivors to tell stories that are exactly these things. Such language reinforces the assumption that, that the Holocaust must necessarily have been the worst thing that ever happened to a survivor in his or her life. 
and everything since has been a slow march away from that horror into sunnier uplands. But that is not how survivors, or certainly the child survivors I interviewed, describe their own lives. Here are some of the words they used in our conversations. Confusing, broken, pockmarked, incomplete, fractured. How can there be such an enormous disconnect between how survivors see their own stories and what audiences want to hear in these stories? I think it's one of the tasks of historians to make sense of this, to reject some of the moralizing and quasi-hagiographic veneers that have come to cover up the complex reality of survivors' stories. And with our eyes on the issue of aftermaths and memories, think about these pockmarked stories for what they are, evidence of the very long and complex reach of conflict and genocide through entire human lives. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I think we're going to pick up on some of the things that you said as well. Um, our book isn't out yet, <laughs> um, but it's, it is called A Kinder Transport, A Transnational Journey. Um, I really I really admire your book, especially how you talk about um, reunion being um, a moment of, of celebration of, of knowing that a parent has survived and, and the child as well, but also this moment that plunges people into more distress. Um, and this is what happened in, with regards to reunions with kinder transportees and their parents, but also that moment of arrival wasn't necessarily one of, oh, everything's rosy now and I'm safe. But it, it, you know, there were more hurdles to overcome. Um, so the start of our book, hopefully, when it's out there, um, will hopefully redefine the kinder transport. Um, so what do we mean by kinder transport? Well, um, as, as we do know, the kinder transport was an international rescue scheme um, as Jewish children embarked upon multiple journeys before, during and after the beginning of the Second World War. These children, or kinder as, as they're collectively known today, um, fled their homes in Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia and Poland. Um, which, runs, which were under Nazi occupation, to Britain, the Netherlands, France, Belgium, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland. The kinder transport was a process of relocation as a result of new hurdles the kinder had to face in their host nations as well. Um, they became enemy aliens, as, as, which has been talked more about now, as they were interned in Britain, and then um, some were sent to Canada and Australia, or moved as emigrants to um, America and New Zealand during the war itself, but also after. Um, in the post-war period, the kinder made yet further journeys to be either reunited with family, um, which did work out in some cases and, and didn't in others, um, while other children went to Israel and the kinder set up some of the first kibbutzism, um, such as Kibbutz Labi, there, there are other, other ones as well, but that, that there's an archive there. <laughs> um, some kinder even um, returned to their former homelands. Um, a lot served in the Allied forces, for example, and were so central in the denazification process um, that we've had these amazing stories um, recently where um, one kinder transportee um, gets this really um, wonderful recommendation letter from um, this high up official in the British Army saying, how well he's doing working with um, the local Germans in this particular area that borders, I think, Denmark, um, and just how valuable he is, his language skills, for example. Um, but also this letter is all about um, reconnecting with a former homeland that has kicked him out. Um, it's also about, it's also a story of, of reconciliation in a way that the whole the whole letter is really interesting that he that there is this sense of forgiveness in a way um throughout the letter it's it's an it's an incredible document um and yeah and in while in other cases um 
those who found refuge in countries bordering Germany, such as the Netherlands, so the, ch the children that didn't always make that further journey to Britain or those that remained in France, um, survived the war or in some cases um, were deported and murdered in the Holocaust. So um, I've interviewed uh, Kinder's family, Kinder families recently that um, got off the train in, in Holland and were later interned in... Uh, you mean Voigt? Yeah. Yeah. Best of all. Yeah, I say that because my pronunciation's not great. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're the German expert. Um, yeah, we're, we're interned there and um, both survived incredibly. Um, one helped, well, was forced to help build um, the railway to Auschwitz. Another one was present on Anne Frank's medical examination there. Both as I said, survived, had met each other in the camp, and then later um, found each other again in America and married. Um, so some really incredible stories there. So I think we may, for a long time, we've saw the kinder transport as the journey. Um, but I think our book really wants to look at subsequent journeys as a result of the kinder transport. So expanding the kinder transport temporarily can't say that word, temporarily, that's not a word I can say today, um, but also um, conceptually as well, that the kinder transport wasn't just a movement to Britain, but beyond Britain, um, you know, yes, there were a set of historical circumstances that led up to the precise decision being made in Britain to, to bring the children out, um, but there were, there were lots of government um, uh, actions in other countries as well. Um, so thinking about does the kinder transport refer to a British rescue or does it refer to a German exile? Does it refer to trains that left or trains that arrived? Um, and as we know, there are kinder transports to other host nations. Do they use the term to sort of give weight and recognition um, because the British one is so known? Um, and seeing the kinder transport in other contexts that, as we've just seen, that, well, not just seen, but as I've talked about, um, some of the kinder transportees that got off the trains and were sadly um, caught up and sent sent to um, the death camps either were murdered or, or incredibly survived, um, that the kinder transport wasn't just a rescue. It didn't automatically mean survival. Um, sadly, I know some kinder transport stories where they were interned and sent to other countries and committed suicide. Again, rescue did not mean a happy ever ending story. Um, more recently on social media. Um, right, so Orlogs Bronnen, I'm not sure I'm any better at this than you would be, a national monument camp void and Yad Vashem. Yeah, so on, on these sort of um, digital platforms, um, they're using the term kinder transport to refer to transports to death, not transports to life. Um, in David Cesarani's book about Eichmann, he also, um, interestingly, in the glossary and the abbreviations, the kinder transport is, is this, kinder transport, a specially chartered train evacuating Jewish children from Germany before 1939. Later, Nazi term for deportation train carrying Jewish children. And he specifically is referring to um, a meeting between Eichmann and um, a fellow uh, um, transport officer here um, about movements from France to Poland. Um, I'll let you read the quote out because it's in, partly in German. Um, so Eichmann used the same term, Kindertransport. Kindertransporter können rollen, so the, ch the children's transports can roll, they can, they can be started. Um, and he was saying this in relation to those that were being deported, not those that were being rescued. Um, so the term itself can mean trains to life, trains to death. Um, interestingly, thinking about Vera K. Fass's book, which um, Joe, our publisher, also um, uh, published, um, I would say which is the most up-to-date um, history of the kinder transport. Um, 
she talks about moving the kinder transport and looking at the, the period 38 to 48, um, with the initial kinder transport being um, 38, 39. But Rabbi Schoenfeld's work obviously continued, um, well, during and after the war. So she includes that in, within her definition to, to broaden that definition. Um, yeah. Pinch the notes. I can remember. Um, I think what, yeah, what Amy. I'll, I'll be with you in a second. Uh, what Amy said about trains to life and trains to death, and I just wanted to. I don't know if you've seen the uh, memorial in Berlin by Frank Frank Meisler at Friedrichstraße, which initially so it's a Kinder Transport memorial, and it's set out initially just to show a group of children going on the Kinder Transport, so in parallel to the group that arrived in London that we see in the memorial there. And due to pressure from uh, the Berlin authorities, he was made to include or invite, invited to reconsider because they thought it looked like a group of kids going on a school outing. Mm. So he reconsidered and the result of the reconsideration was that a second group of figures was added to the memorial, which showed children going to Auschwitz. So this idea of trains to life and trains to death is very much intimately connected in that memorial. And I think what Amy was saying is that we need to tell the, the story of the kinder transport within the context of the, the Holocaust as well. I think too much, too often it's been separated from it. I mean, the trains to life and trains to death intimately connect the families. Those who managed to get away on the kinder transport lost their family members on trains to the east in many, many cases. In some lucky cases, they, were, they survived, but in most cases, they didn't. So there's an intimate connection there, and that raises questions, of course, what it meant the parents and other siblings who remained in Germany to be without those who had gone on the kinder transport and what it meant for those on the kinder transport to be without their parents and siblings, what that separation meant. And also the constant fear and anxiety about what was happening in both cases, the sudden stopping of the Red Cross letters, the contact with the minimal contact that there was. This is an intimately connected hist history. Um, and that's something I think that we would very much want to, to put into focus in, in, in the book. Um, there is a tendency to, to talk about kinder transportees, and this is what something Rebecca was touching on and saying that those who survived the camps are, as it were, the true survivors. Um, and I think it's a tendency to say that kinder transportees were not Holocaust survivors. They cannot be considered Holocaust survivors in any real sense. And um, we've had some, not arguments about this, but one or two cases, some quite heated discussions at least. Um, whereas it seems to, to us, at any rate, that had they not got out in 1938, they would almost, on 39, they would almost certainly have died. So they, and do you only survive something if you come out at the end of it? Or do you survive it by not having gone it, been lucky enough to have escaped it in the first place with the inevitable corollary had being, had you not escaped, you would have ended up on that ship, in that camp, with the same fate because it involves a certain judgment, a certain almost value judgment, that if you've not survived in that way, you're not a proper survivor, you're not someone who's gone through as much as those who've survived the camp. But the children went through enormous amounts of pain and agony, even in Britain, even where they were lucky enough to escape. We know about what happened to them in some foster homes with some foster parents. They were used as domestics. They were in some cases abused. All these stories are well enough known now. But we have to ask what that means as well on top of the separation from the parents and the anxiety that I talked about. So that transnational history will also look, I think, not just at the context of the Holocaust, but the context of the war. And that was something you talk, talked about, that these children who'd arrived in Britain as German refugees or Austrian refugees, Jewish refugees, in some cases, Polish and Czech or Slovakian, um, many of them then or some of them at least ended up in internment camps at the start of the war when they were no longer classified so much as Jews as as Germans. Uh, they suddenly belonged, as it were, or there was a threat to, of them being perceived as belonging to the other side. Now, the British government did realize their error, I think, after a while. It hadn't done this, but it happened for long enough to make us ask about that, um, the influence, the impact that has on the, the identity of a child, separated from the parents, so first of all, you, you're brought up in Germany. If you're in a Christian family, a converted family, you gradually learn under Nazism, you're in fact a Jew. If you ever do really come to understand that, you probably don't in many cases. Then you come to Britain as a Jew, and then you're interned as a German. 
uh, and then if you come out of the camp, there were cases of, of, of um, German kinder transportees, Austrian kinder transportees who joined the British army and then didn't only become British, but they actually fought on the side of the British. That's as British surely as you can possibly be. And it raises sort of questions about, if you want to talk to that. So yeah, so it raises questions too about the, the impact of all this on, on identity. So. Those are sort of some of the points, the, the longer term influence. So the question of to what extent the kinder transport is part of the Holocaust and to what extent it needs to be understood too as part of the war. I think those two are questions we want to address. Yeah, and also we've, we've learned a lot of stories about those that had places on the kinder transport, but then never went on the kinder transport. So are they kinder? Are they not kinder? Um, Ruth Kluger is one, she, you know, she, her family had discussions, for example, about going on the kinder transport and then never went. Um, but there are people that have like the, the actual documentation to say they were going and then never went. Um, those that were on the last Winton train that didn't leave, some did were able to flee and go to Swe uh, Sweden, sorry. Many were murdered. So are they kinder? Are they you know, th 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 there's a lot to think about here. Um, <laughs> but in terms of, um, so why do we need this transnational history then? Um, well, it, it's to place it within all these wider contexts that we've just spoke about. Um, most of the history books on the kinder transport at the moment um, very much focus on Britain, or if they don't focus on Britain, they're sort of chapters within edited volumes. So for example, um, the, there are several edited volumes that do look at um, kinder transports to New Zealand or uh, uh, Canada and, and places like that. However, they don't combine this history. So you look at the edited volume and you can you can grasp and you can see place these histories side by side and make something of it. But there isn't necessarily a comparative piece that looks at these nations and their policies, their um, how the kinder felt, um, how they were relocated, how they were, you know, uh, taken in, into these various different homes, how the hostels work, how the um, the foster families work, you know, how that is different across um, several borders, and also how all these different organisations um, working in Germany, working in Britain, in Sweden, in, in Belgium, for example. Um, you know, there were, there were cross actions across borders, um, but there were different conditions. Um, and there isn't a book that sort of pulls all this together. It's very separated at the moment. Um, so that's one thing that we, we hope to do. Most of, as I was saying, the, the historiography at the moment is very British centered um, with sort of chapters on the wider history. And you have to see these in relation to sort of make anything broader of that. Um, but I think that's also because of um, the focus on the definition being very British centred as well. But there is more in Germany now. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are German books which are also focused on Britain, but um, increasingly, I think there's an interest in kinder transports to other countries too. I think of German books about kinder transports to Sweden, to Belgium, to France. So, um, and a lot of them have come about um, because former kinder have come back to give talks to German schools or to German municipalities. And uh, in the course of that, as there's been a kind of growing interest in the topic as the remaining Holocaust survivors or whatever we want to call them. Uh, and that's triggered a number of exhibitions and triggered a number of books. And that also means, of course, that the story not just of escape to Britain, but also to Sweden and Belgium has been told. I mean, one example is in the town of Dinslaken where there was a Jewish orphanage and a number of those children, I think 250, went on a kinder transport to Belgium. There were all together, I think, four kinder transports to Belgium. And this, again, of course, is part of the history of the Holocaust because many of them were then caught up um, in the uh, invasion of the Nazis and occupation by the Nazis. Um, and there's also the Avni School in Cologne, where there's also been a number of publications where quite a few of the children ended up in Palestine. Um, so that is, is, and it's interesting that in these German studies, there's often a reference, reference in the exhibitions to in Germany to the number 20,000 rather than 10,000, and there was some discussion around this, but also with colleagues, why is it suddenly 20,000? I said, well, what about all the children that went to Belgium, that went to France, that a few went to Switzerland, that went to 
uh, Sweden and also um, um, a number of other countries, and quite a lot went to Sweden. Um, it's just generally not really figured very much in the British representation of the kinder transport. So that is also part of that transnational history what we want to bring out. Um, so, yeah, the, the, there is more in German historiography on these wider transports, I think, but they're very often local or regional studies rather than kind of like central major books with major publishers. Um, and yeah, just the last few minutes of our talk, we were just going to uh, say that there is more of awareness now, I would say, of, a, of transnational history, but does that map the, the memory? Um, this book, the, the la very last chapter, will we'll move on to memory, um, something that my uh, PhD looked at. Um, yeah, while, while there seems to be, we, we can see these transnational, transnational journeys, these physical movements across borders, movements between different identities, German, Jewish, French, American, um, all these volunteer networks that happen across borders, um, the political systems that work across borders, um, the reunions and acts of reconciliation that happen across borders. But in terms of memory, national memory seems to, to dominate the discourse. It, the kinder transport, as, as I looked at in my PhD, but also hopefully at the end of this book, the way in which it's remembered is very nationally focused still. Um, there are hints towards a transnational memory, <laughs> um, but, but it is very nationally focused with Britain mainly focusing on the arrival and welcome aspect. There are more critical things coming in, but just for an overview now, um, whereas Germany, it's quite, it's quite different, isn't it? Yeah, I think the German memory of the kinder transport set in much later than, than in Britain. Um, but there have been quite a few exhibitions in the last two or three years, and there was a famous, famous in Germany, perhaps a well-known uh, TV film based on Ruth Barnett's life called um, uh, Regional Court or Landgericht. Uh, and the novel it was based on also won the German, um, a German book prize, so it got quite a lot of publicity. Um, there have also been a number of small films that I can think of, and new memorials. So there's a new memorial in Frankfurt by Yale Batana to the kinder transport. And that's really a sort of classical example. I mean, it's, she's an Israeli artist and, and we should be careful here of saying this is how the Germans do memory, but this is the one that, that won the competition. And it focuses very much on that moment of parting where the parents say to the children, um, you know, lieb uh, wohl mein Kind, so I hope you do okay. And, and goodbye father, goodbye mother. So those parting words and see you soon. Yeah, which of course never happens. Uh, so there's no focus here on the journey. It's it's on that moment of parting and what it meant for, for the children, for the parents, what hopes it evoked and what despair must then necessarily have followed when it wasn't soon. It went on for years and years and maybe it was never. There was never a point where they were reunited. Um, and that, I think, is generally typical of the German reception of the kinder transport, that it looks very much up to the moment of departure. What then happens to the children in Britain is there in some exhibitions um, and is pointed out in some memorials, but not nearly to the same extent that it is in Britain. It's almost as if the German memory says, well, once they've got to the border, we don't have any more responsibility for remembering them. That's not entirely true. There are, I can think of one or two exhibitions which do go far beyond that. Or they have a particularly critical take. Um, think of the, the one in Augsburg, which um, has a couple of stories about a couple of brothers who committed suicide. And there's a similar one in Frankfurt, uh, these two brothers, one of whom, there was two siblings and they were, they were separated, I think, when they arrived in Britain, and one of them committed suicide shortly after the separation, and the other committed suicide in 1945 or 46, I think, shortly after the news of the father's death came through. And these stories are kind of emblematic for the continuation of transportation. The trauma went with you, you know, you didn't end your trauma when you got on that train. A kind of different story to the British story is the trauma stops when you arrive and you set those two very much in contrast. The truth, of course, is somewhere in between, I think. But um, and the last thing to say about, about the, I want to say about the kinder transport memory in Germany is there's a lot more comparisons to the present situation with Syrian refugees, other refugees, and number two or three exhibitions. It's sort of happening in Britain, but I think it's happening more in Germany, but we can we can talk about that. But there are there are setting in relation to those different phase. And then we probably don't have time now, but the sort of incorporation of testimony in the book as well is really interesting. Um, we've interviewed over 100 survivors, much like, like yourself, and it, it's which is an incredible experience in itself. But the sort of making sure that their voice is present, especially thinking about the future of, of historiography, that 
Um, they are so central to the narrative, but we can pick it up during questions. <laughs> Can I stand? Yeah. Will it work with the camera? Is it, is it okay if I stand then? I'd rather. Can I? Can I stand? Then I don't have the table problem. Um, see? <laughs> Um, evening, everybody, and thank you to the organisers for the invitation to speak tonight. It's really a pleasure to be doing an in-person event. Uh, I guess the problem with going last is that some of what I wanted to say has already been foreshadowed, um, as you'll see. Uh, but that's that's okay. I've got other things to, to talk about as well. So, I'll, but I will pick up on a couple of the things that have been said, particularly about the changing meaning of uh, the term survivor, for example, as well as uh, as well as a few other things. So, I want to say a little bit about the book itself, um, the liberation of the camps, and then I'll say a bit more about the, the broader context of the book and why um, I think the topic lends itself to a broader understanding of, uh, of post-war European history. And then I'll come back to the question that Christine raised at the, at the start about the future of Holocaust studies and Holocaust historiography and talk uh, a little bit about that, because as um, Rebecca said at the start, the uh, the literature is now uh, so mountainous that no single person can hope to uh, hope to get through it, even if you could possibly read every uh, every language in Europe and and beyond. So, um, you know, it's 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 in some ways a very complicated situation that we that we find ourselves in. Well, I mean, the first thing to say is I, I would like to be able to tell you that uh, writing this book was was part of a brilliant master plan of mine to um, to write a book for the 70th anniversary of the liberation, and it was planned years in, in advance. Uh, in fact, uh, what happened was that Heather McCullum from Yale uh, suggested to me a year or two before that, uh, she said to me, wouldn't it be a good idea for somebody to write a book about the liberation of the camps? And, and I said, yeah, it would be, but not me. Um, and then I went home and I thought about it for a bit and I thought, actually, you know, I could probably do that and um, I'll, I know where to look for the stuff and I can, uh, I'm going to do that book. And the reason I, I think I wanted to do it was, was because the more I thought about it, the more I realised that although there was a very large specialist literature on the subject with, with respect to particular sites and what happened to, to people in those sites, there were only, in English at least, only two books uh, dealing with the liberation of the camps, both very old, uh, both partial uh, and problematic. I'm still quite useful in some ways, but but uh, enormously out of date, really, with respect to the contemporary uh, historiography. Uh, so I thought here's a good opportunity to uh, to say more about it. And uh, the other thing that drove me, and I think this is one thing that uh, picks up on what Rebecca said, and that and that uh, is a theme throughout the book, is that I wanted to to really get away from the notion of liberation. Uh, I mean, the part of the problem here is the, the words, the very basic words we use, liberation as a kind of happy end to a terrible story. Liberation should really, I think, be used in uh, scare quotes, uh, because I think one of the things I wanted to show uh, from the outset of the book is that, um, first of all, despite the title, uh, not everybody who was liberated was liberated in a camp. Uh, there were large numbers of Holocaust survivors who emerged out of hiding. Uh, there were people... Um, and I'll come back to this, large numbers of people, uh, Polish Jews who'd spent the war years um, as uh, refugees in the Soviet Union who returned uh, to Poland after the end of the war. Uh, there were people who were liberated, but who didn't know they'd been liberated, didn't know that the war had ended. Um, uh, people who were abandoned uh, by guards, uh, who were sent on trains, uh, didn't know where they were until they were discovered by Allied troops and so on. Uh, so there were all sorts of um, complicated scenarios in which people found themselves and so one of the things that's really i think crucial for understanding this topic is that although there, there are and I, I give examples there were people who experienced liberation as if it were a, Hol a hollywood film um where the troops turn up and they all rush out screaming and shouting and and, and um uh, throwing themselves on uh, on the soldiers. This did happen in, in a few instances, but at the same time as those people who were well enough to understand what was happening were doing that, there were also often people in the very same site who uh, not only were too ill to move, but who didn't know what was happening, who were, were too ill to, to, under, to understand even what was, uh, what was going on. 
Then we have a situation afterwards when people do understand that they've uh, been liberated, uh, when, as Rebecca said, they end up um, not just wondering what to do with themselves, but incarcerated again. So people, uh, in, first of all, in, in displaced persons camps, um, and in some cases, uh, during the period of the, the Ali Abet, the illegal um, uh, emigration to Palestine, interned on, in camps uh, in Cyprus. So there's a, this whole process of uh, prolonged incarceration that takes place. And of course, uh, the DPs, the displaced persons, make great play of this in terms of anti-British uh, and anti um, well, anti-British policy in particular, but of course this ties in, I'll come back to this, this ties in with broader uh, Cold War uh, Cold War themes that, that show that the, the liberation of the camps as a narrow topic also uh, feeds into much bigger uh, topics uh, such as the, uh, the development of refugee policy and the, um, the demise of empire and the beginnings of, uh, of the Cold War. The, the survivors themselves then often discovered after liberation that they... Um, were the sole survivors, not just of their families, but of their hometowns, their whole communities. And uh, one of the things that survivors did, uh, and we see this a lot after the war, despite uh, officially being uh, supp supposedly uh, confined to a particular DP camp, they traveled uh, under extraordinarily complicated circumstances when there was um, destroyed infrastructure across much of Europe, uh, with with no you know, no timetables and no nowhere to stay and no shelter and no food and so on. They set off at the first whiff uh, that there might be a surviving relative somewhere. Uh, these people would travel uh, across uh, half of Europe in order to try and uh, find uh, find their relatives. Or in the case of teenage uh, survivors, they would. Uh, travel from DP camps back to their countries of origin, Hungary or Romania, or whatever, in order to try and look for their parents, usually unsuccessfully, uh, before returning to uh, the DP camps. So these people then were lonely. What we see this throughout the book is a, a deep existential loneliness. So liberation is not this uh, happy new beginning. It's a time of new troubles. Um, people who are physically and psychologically ill, often for many, many years, perhaps in some cases for the whole of their lives, um, who then are incarcerated again, who then have to try and relocate to a third country to learn a new language, um, start new lives, etc. What I think is remarkable, this I don't really talk in, in, about in, in this book, uh, is uh, that some of the psychological studies of, of survivors actually shows um, how remarkably well adjusted uh, many of them are in, in later life. Uh, and that yes, of course, there are people who suffer from um, PTSD, we would now call it concentration camp syndrome, as it was first known. Um, but actually, many of them uh, really did uh, establish uh, normal uh, lives in, uh, in many, many ways. Uh, so for me, I think I just wanted to say, you know, I've, I've written on lots of different subjects, but this writing this book was really hard and I, talk, I try and explain this to my students in, in some ways that it was harder to write about the liberation process than in some ways to write about the killing process and I, I think it has to do with the descriptions provided by the, um, the liberating soldiers and the, the nurses and other charity workers uh, who showed up uh, in, at the camps in uh, the spring of 1945 and the descriptions that they give of the living mingled with the dead and the inability uh, to tell the two apart in in many cases it's it's really um i think even now some of these passages are, are very hard to read and so i, I am going to uh, read a couple to just to give you um an, a couple of examples of, of of what i mean so uh one of the chapters in the book concerns um liberations carried out by the Red Army, because in the um, English language uh, historiography, uh, there was almost nothing on, uh, on that subject. And so I wanted to write about the Soviets um, and, uh, and what, what they'd done. And this is, uh, in, in 1980, there was a conference held in uh, Washington, DC, as part of the preparation for the creation of the, the Holocaust Museum in DC. And um, it brought together survivors and liberators and, and others, including former Red Army uh, soldiers and uh, one, uh, Georgi Elizavetsky, um, wrote uh, what he spoke at this conference, and he said, "When I entered the barrack, I saw living skeletons lying on the three-tiered bunks. As in fog, I hear my soldiers saying, 
You are free comrades. I sense that they do not understand us and begin speaking to them in Russian, Polish, German, Ukrainian dialects. Unbuttoning my leather jacket, I show them my medals. Then I use Yiddish. Their reaction is unpredictable. They think that I am provoking them. They begin to hide. And only when I said to them, do not be afraid. I'm a Colonel of the Soviet army and a Jew. We have come to liberate you. Finally, as if the barrier collapsed, they rushed towards us shouting, fell on their knees, kissed the flaps of our overcoats and threw their arms around our legs. And we could not move, stood motionless while unexpected tears ran down our cheeks. And that's, um, you know, that's a Colonel of the Red Army that fought its way uh, west, um, conquering territory. And the descriptions, I think this is one of the things that shocked people in at this conference in 1980, the descriptions offered by um, the former Red Army soldiers, once they were outside of the Soviet Union and didn't have to use the kind of official Marxist-Leninist uh, vocabulary, was exactly the same as that given by the uh, Western Allied soldiers um, in terms of how shocked they were, you know, despite their uh, being battle hardened and so on, uh, the, the encounter with uh, with the camps was something that they uh, were still startled by uh, many uh, many years later. Um, and I just uh, give you a, a comparable uh, example. This is from Marcus Smith, an American doctor um, from uh, Dachau in uh, April 1945. An incredible sight, a stench that is beyond experience, horror stricken, outraged. We react with disbelief. Oh God, says Rosenblum. Ferris, silent, and so is Howcroft, his vocabulary inadequate to describe this circle of evil. I hear Hollis, our car counting driver, say that even primitive savage people give a decent burial to their own dead and the dead of their enemies. I shut my eyes. This cannot be the 20th century, I think. I try to remember the redeeming attributes of man. None comes to mind. And I think these, um, these sorts of statements, you know, coming from soldiers are, are really uh, shocking, I think, in, in, in many ways. And I, I find still that no matter how many times I read these accounts, particularly from Belsen and, and Dachau and Buchenwald, that the, they don't get any easier to, to read. And uh, that, I think, was, uh, for me, I think, one of the um, motivations to, to write this book. But um, this question here about, you know, the the 20th century, um, about savagery and, and primitivism and modernity and so on, means that there's a, there are bigger questions here. And I think I just want to mention uh, a few of them. The survivors, who at first, of course, were, as Rebecca says, not survivors uh, in, in the sense that we understand them now. They were former camp inmates who then became displaced persons, who then became refugees or exiles. Uh, who then became new citizens of, uh, of, uh, of, of third countries. Um, they uh, were, as I've said, in, held in DP camps. Um, and the way that they were figured by the authorities uh, mattered insofar as uh, not just the immediate context, but today, thinking back to what uh, Amy was saying about Syrian refugees and so on, the, uh, the definition of a refugee, the, the 1951 Refugee Convention itself stems from uh, this period. So the, the post-war architecture put in place for administering uh, refugees and, and treating them comes from the experience of, uh, of Holocaust survivors. So people who were um, displaced persons who then turned into refugees with the help of specific international organizations uh, set up to do so. Uh, so first of all, the, um, the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, which was uh, succeeded in 1948 by the International Refugee Organization, which is what today the UNHCR. Um, and the, the way in which the, um, those organizations treated survivors is itself extremely revealing about the time. So in a sense, the, um, the Holocaust survivors provide a kind of bridge between the war, the Holocaust, and uh, the way in which post-war Europe uh, in general developed in, uh, in the early post-war uh, Cold War cleavage. So I'll give you an, an example. The, um, what, one of the things I wanted to do in, in this book was uh, to make use of 
the archives of the International Tracing Service, so a digital copy of which is held here at the, at the Wiener Holocaust Library. Um, and uh, for those who, who don't know, the, uh, the International Tracing Service was a, a body which uh, began life uh, set up towards the end of the war uh, by, uh, by the Allies. Um, it has a complicated sort of alphabet soup of institutional history, which I can happily bore you about for hours if you want um, afterwards. Uh, but by 1948, it became the International Tracing Service, and um, it was set up in order to help people uh, trace their relatives, not Germans, but, you know, but citizens of um, United Nations countries. Um, and it, after 1955, it was uh, administered by the International Committee of the Red Cross, uh, who over time increasingly ran it as a closed archive uh, used only for tracing, and they kept the historians and, and others out, uh, maintaining that there was nothing much of interest in there. And when it was finally opened, um, just over 10 years or so ago now, uh, it turns out that there's um, 30 million documents in there, over 100 million pages of stuff. It's the world's largest collection of material relating to Nazi persecution. Not all of it unique to, to that particular archive, much of it copied from elsewhere, but huge runs of material relating to the concentration camps and also to the post-war period, to the, uh, the care of uh, displaced persons and, and refugees. And so all the material from the International Refugee Organization is there, for example. So I wanted to use some um, examples from the IRO treatment of refugees. And one of the things that they did was to interview people who applied for IRO assistance in moving to a third country. Um, and what's I, th I think striking here is exactly as uh, the other speakers have been saying, people who we would probably now not think for a moment about as, um, as survivors who were excluded from being helped at the time because they were not thought of as survivors in the way uh, that we were. And this is particularly true um, in the late 1940s. So as the Cold War in Europe was, was setting in, you had the refugees learned that they had to change their script. They needed to say, I, I don't want to live in Hungary anymore because I I'm not a communist. Um, and if you were uh, saying you needed assistance because you'd been persecuted on racial grounds, this didn't really get you very far anymore. And some of these cases are extraordinary. So I'll, I'll just read you one. This is from 13th of September, 1948 um, in Rome. This is uh, dealing with uh, a Romanian uh, man named Benno Fuchs. And the IRO caseworker has written on his form, petitioner is a Romanian Jew who when his homeland was occupied by the Hungarians in 1942, uh, was deported to Russia for forced labor. After 18 months, however, he was allowed to return home because of illness. Then in May, 1944, the Hungarians sent him to the Auschwitz concentration camp from which he was released eight months later by the Russians and permitted to go back to Romania. I mean, there's so much wrong about that that I don't know where to start, but in any case, that's what it says. And then it, uh, it goes on. On the 14th of March, 1948, petitioner left his home illegally for Hungary, where he altered an invalid Romanian passport and succeeded in using it to reach Italy. During his interview before the review board on the 10th of September, 1948, he admitted that conditions in, uh, in the fur business, that's what he was making his living from, were extremely bad, and that he had emigration to Canada or Paraguay in mind since 1945, but was always refused a Romanian passport. Petitioner also admitted that he has never been persecuted uh, at home. This is, this is typed, and then the, the case someone else has, written, has added in, in pencil at home um, as an addition and that his sole activity was as a member of the Zionist party. Petitioner is not within the mandate of the organization. A man who'd been in Auschwitz, right? And this is a, 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 a Romanian survivor of Auschwitz. He's obviously come from uh, Northern Transylvania since um, it talks about the fact that the Hungarians had occupied his, um, his, his home. Um, unthinkable, I think, really for us now that somebody like that uh, should not be considered a survivor and, and was refused the assistance of the International Refugee Organization because uh, he'd not been persecuted at home. I and mean, it seems to me like he probably had uh, since he'd been deported from his home and sent, sent to Auschwitz, uh, but that's a, um, a different matter. And then of course, there were other people by contrast who were gaming the system, uh, claiming to have been persecuted, 
um, who um, did in fact manage to receive the assistance of the IRO, although they, to be fair they were actually quite good uh, at rooting out people with, uh, with fascist uh, backgrounds and so on. Um, so uh, the, the book I, I wanted to uh, try and make the case that you know, I wasn't simply talking about the moment of the liberation of the camps, but that the, uh, for individuals uh, liberation was a much longer process and that the uh, the importance of the phenomenon of liberation is that it uh, draws a link between the war and the Holocaust and um, post-war years, particularly the architecture of uh, early human rights um, uh, legislation. Uh, do I have a few minutes to go on? Okay, so let me, I just want to say a, a couple of things then about uh, the future of, of Holocaust studies. And let me say, um, I agree with what Rebecca said, and if we can't use the term fragmentation, um, then at least I think we can use the term diversification. I mean, if you think now, uh, just in terms of what we've talked about here, which is, uh, I suppose we could call aftermath studies, uh, there's a huge amount of literature done now, not just in, in memory, but on, uh, on children, on DP camps, uh, on uh, networks of survivors, on what happened to Yiddish as a language, and it's, um, it's spread to new parts of the world, the memorial books that were written in Yiddish. Um, I think there's really a, a revival of interest in uh, the immediate post-war uh, Yiddish uh, writings. Uh, the collection of early testimonies or early uh, accounts by survivors, for example, by the Wiener Library uh, and other bodies uh, across Europe and, and beyond. Um, trials, for example, of capos in Israel uh, after the war. There's a new book by Dan Porat on, on that subject, which is uh, extremely interesting. There are a lot of uh, issues uh, concerning the post-war period that I think are going to be uh, more and more uh, investigated. But the years of uh, the Holocaust itself, uh, I think the when you look at the, the scholarly literature now, um, it's vast. And I think one, what, we, what we really see now is that the Holocaust was uh, a transcontinental crime. It was not something that can be reduced to Germans and Jews. This makes no sense. Um, that clearly without uh, the Nazi party and uh, the German uh, state at, uh, at the forefront, the Holocaust would not have happened, that's obvious. But um, everywhere across Europe and beyond, the Germans found uh, collaborators for one reason and another. And so the crime uh, of the Holocaust was not simply a German crime, uh, and the significance of the Holocaust is uh, something that uh, has to do with European and world history. Jewish refugees ended up in the Philippines, in Bolivia, uh, in Mauritius, um, in the Dominican Republic. Uh, this, is, this is world history. This is not uh, simply about Germans uh, and Jews. Uh, within that, I won't go on because I know I'm running out of time. Within that, um, I think the turn to Eastern Europe in particular is uh, extremely important, that uh, since the end of the Cold War, uh, the development of the historiography, particularly in Poland and Hungary, is uh, is remarkable. Um, there's still, I think, some work to be done to in some places, Greece, for example, to join up uh, local histories with the bigger history of the Holocaust and beyond. Um, but the uh, what we see is um, a lot of work being done, and now as well, in, I think, in, in Romania and, and other parts of Eastern Europe, uh, that really shows how the Holocaust was played out uh, at local level, not just because of Germans, but because of um, all sorts of other uh, structures from individual collaborators to police forces to collaborating uh, regimes. The case of Romania is, I think, a particularly important one because there you see um, the case of an independent state, uh, which under uh, Marshal Ion Antonescu uh, carried out its, its own Holocaust. Again, without the Germans um, leading the way, it wouldn't have happened. But the, um, the, the Jews deported from northern Bukovina uh, and Bessarabia to uh, the bit of uh, what's today uh, mostly Moldova uh, that the, that the um, Romanians called Transnistria uh, were killed by the Romanians, as were the local Ukrainian uh, Jews from Odessa and, uh, and uh, the vicinity. Uh, the largest single massacre of the Holocaust uh, took place um, in Bogdanovka, a place that nobody in the English-speaking world has heard of, uh, in December 1941, when 51,000 uh, Jews were shot uh, by uh, under Romanian uh, control, but by Ukrainian um, shooters. 
so there's still a lot, I think, to, to be learned about uh, the Ukrainian, uh, the, the Romanian uh, Holocaust. Sorry. So uh, the questions come. I'll finish with um, returning to what to the question that Rebecca raised about uh, what unites all this. I think, um, in a way, you know, you can look at uh, Amsterdam. Uh, Salonica, Vilnius, Brussels, and say these are all completely different, completely different contexts, and how the Holocaust played out in each of these places was was different, and that's true. So I think what unites them is, on the one hand, you have a, a heterogeneous background, but you end up with a homogeneous outcome. That's to say, everywhere that the Nazis went and they found collaborators, the result was the same, which was the murder of the Jews of Europe, and in that sense this uh, diversification of, of the historiography leads to a kind of homogeneous conclusion. I'll stop there, thank you. Thanks for that. Thank you to our panel. Um, I think every presentation and every discussion sort of fit really well together and built on each other and showed in some ways the relationship between historical memory and writing of history and the different approaches that, you, that you've all taken. So I want to just take some time now to take some questions from the audience here and online. Um, if you can raise your hand and then we'll bring you a microphone because then people online can hear your question if you don't mind. Um, and then of course, when you guys answer your question, if you can just take a microphone um, or I can hand you mine. So any questions? Yes. Um, I just, do you want to do it or? Okay. Um, thanks very much. It was all very interesting. Uh, um, I wanted to ask um, Amy, because um, it just occurred to me, whether you would consider Judith Carr, the author of When Hit the Stalking Rabbit, to be one of the kinder. She fled with her parents to another country. And whether the book that you and Bill are writing will include literature like that about the Holocaust. I think that's a really interesting one. We often think of the kinder as being unaccompanied, but I know lots of families that the parent travelled on the kinder transport with them and then got off at the border with uh, Holland. Um, it's something that we were talking about today, wasn't it? You know, the, these stories of the children that fled before Crystal Match, you know, what, what, are they kinder? Are they not kinder? Um, it's something that I'm still thinking about. Um, I wouldn't want to say too much now about it, but it's just going off what Dan and Rebecca have said, something that we didn't talk about in the talk is, um, how a lot of the kinder through a lot of the, the, the previous histories have been quite passive and in, in these in several exhibitions as well but they have real agency like some of the kinder become rescuers they actually get their parents out in some cases like trying to get visas for them but also that I know one particular kin, kinder transportee that um, worked with the children at Windermere and they gave him a card and all these incredible stories. Um, in terms of literature, um, a yes and no. Um, it might come into the to the very end of the book where we talk about um, moving on to memory and representation. Um, don't know. Um, well, you did literature on your thesis, didn't you? So I Amy, mean, I think did quite a bit on the thesis on that. Um, and there's also, you know, some more work being done on literature. I don't think we were going to include literature. Um, it would obviously be something good to do, but I think we were going to just focus on the history, maybe in the memory chapter. I think we've got one or two chapters at the end. We might include literature and how it refracts the topic. Um, but again, it very much, I think, reflects the different interests of the countries. I mean, I think even the Ruth Barnett story, if you take it in the British version of it and compare it with the German, the version in the German novel, um, that's a version... Yeah, which looks very much at the post-45, the post-1950 period when the father of Ruth Barnett returns to Germany and becomes involved in um, compensation cases, trying to get reparations and compensation for Jewish and other non-Jewish survivors in the 50s and the kind of difficulties that he encounters as a result. Um, and very much, it's very much a book about German coming to terms with the past and with Jewish involvement in judicial procedures. It also includes famous Fritz Bauer, but that's in a way the main thrust of the novel, which I think is something you wouldn't probably get in a British novel, but equally there are, there are British themes, aren't there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's quite interesting how many novels there are on the kinder transport. There's quite a lot of children's novels uh, out there as well. and. Um, Many of them, I, I don't think, are as critical as the German ones, but there are certainly some critical, critical ones. 
other questions in the room or we can take one from Sandra. Thanks very much. That was really fascinating to listen to. And all four of you raised this idea that we're moving from um, looking at one point in time for liberation or survival or the kinder transport to processes. Is that reflected in the definition of the Holocaust itself that you use in your work? And I kind of question to all four of you. I'm just reflecting on the question. You know what, maybe this actually gets to the crux of why I don't tend to call myself a Holocaust historian and instead call myself an oral historian or a historian of memory, because I, you're right that in effect, I mean, certainly survivors as a book, it starts in 1945 and it goes through to 2020. So in fact, of course, the subtitle is children's lives after the Holocaust. Um, so I don't know that I've ever thought about it being a sense of my changing my definition of the Holocaust, but rather maybe just being careful about even calling myself a Holocaust historian. It's very much about aftermaths. Um, and that was a kind of almost a personal answer in a way, because in a room full of Holocaust host historians, I've always felt like the odd one out somehow, because I don't work on the war years. I mean, they come into it, obviously, um, but I'm... I, it's always been the post-war world that I wanted to know about. Respond. You want to go or should I go? Um, yeah, I think, it, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion and there still is around when the Holocaust began and Dan will know far more about this than I do, but um, obviously most accounts would start as in the war, but there's discussion around Kristallnacht and the significance that Kristallnacht has for the further developments that led to the Holocaust, or whether it was indeed the start of the Holocaust, or whether the Holocaust started in 1933. I mean, there are lots of discussions about this. In terms of, of our understanding of the kinder transport, I think we very much do believe that for these kinder, that's when it started. They were taken away from what was threatening, which was this huge cloud over their families and over German Jews altogether. Um, and the same was true of Austria, they were escaping what had started to happen, and what had started to happen was a harbinger of what was to come, that in that sense, it certainly was for these children and for the families who sent them, they were sending them because they feared that Kristallnacht was the start of something, whether they were right or wrong at the time, whether, we, whether, whether, whether the Holocaust would not have happened had not other factors come into account, and you can't say that Kristallnacht is anything other, is, is not a, is not a it's not making the Holocaust inevitable. However you interpret Kristallnacht, it was interpreted by many people at the time as a sign that things were getting worse and could only get worse still. And so it was necessary to escape. And in that sense, I think it started there already. And also in terms, of course, of what I was talking about and Amy too, about what happened to their families uh, and about the separation from these families, the further fates of the families, and also many of the kinder who, and Amy mentioned this, some of the kinder, some of that 10,000 that didn't go to Britain, who went to Holland, who went to France, um, not those who went to Sweden, most of whom managed to survive, but quite a few of those who escaped in 30, late 38 or 39 became caught up um, in the, when the, the Nazis occupied Western Europe in Holland and, and France and were then deported to their deaths, not in all cases, but in, in most. So for them too, they may have escaped in late 38 or 39, but that was the passage to their death ultimately. So I think certainly we would want to argue in our book for understanding the, um, the kinder transport in terms of a view of Kristallnacht, which saw it as this, a, not just a, as a harbinger of something much worse to come, as a, a, a massive sense of foreboding. And from that point of view, yes, I think I would expand the concept. I think I want to say no to to your question. Uh, I mean, I've I've written and I would say exactly as uh, the others have done that the Holocaust didn't just end in 1945. But I'm, what I mean by that is that the effects of the Holocaust didn't end in 1945. Um, I I think that the I, I'd be willing to debate. Uh, you know whether we start in 1938 or 1933 or, or or whether this is you know a la christopher browning specifically about the, the decision making process in between 1939 and 1941 doesn't matter but certainly uh, i think when when i talk about the holocaust i mean the 
the murder of the Jews of Europe by Nazi Germany and its allies. And uh, during the, work, the years up to, uh, let's say up to 1945, we'll leave open the question at the beginning for the moment. But I, I think the, the post-war years are part of the history of the, um, the effects of the Holocaust. They're not the Holocaust itself, I think is where I would, but you know, <laughs> maybe you feel differently. <laughs> Thanks, and I think we're going to take a question from our online audience. Yes, we have a question from Michael Baker. He says that it seems to him that a key theme in modern Holocaust studies is the nexus of wider violence in Nazi-occupied Europe that provided the climate for the Holocaust. And Christian Gerlach is very good on this. He says, for example, the Nazi Soviet war led to murder on a vast scale against millions of non Jews as well as Jews. And uh, Michael is asking, what is the view of the panel on this? Uh, that's a really good question. And I think it's, um, it touches on a very sensitive issue in uh, in Holocaust historiography, which has to do with uh, what are the contexts for understanding the Holocaust? Uh, should you only talk about um, the German decision making process? Or does it help to situate the Holocaust into the broader context of um, European history, let's say from the Great War onwards, or even going back before that to encompass uh, histories of colonialism, slavery, etc. You know, to, to what extent do you need to understand European histories of violence in order to understand the Holocaust? And of course, there are historians who think that if you look beyond the, uh, the Nazi regime, in some senses, it leads you to downplay the, uh, the significance of the Holocaust. And there are others who would say, actually, uh, it does nothing of the sort. What it does is um, simply uh, provide you with uh, the kind of understanding without which you don't, without which the, the Nazi regime and the Holocaust look as though they've just come from outer space. Uh, and Nazism didn't come from nowhere. Uh, the violence perpetrated by the Nazis also has, has precedence. So I, I would situate myself in the latter camp to some extent. I, I have no problem with thinking about uh, comparative history, comparative genocide, uh, thinking about, uh, let's say, the origins of Nazism in uh, the, the, the front experience of uh, the Great War and uh, the consequences of that, the Freikorps, the post-war violence, population transfers, ethnic cleansing, and so on that went on in Europe between the wars. But with the proviso that I would say, simply saying that, uh, let's say a la Tim Snyder, that in, um, in Eastern Europe, lots of people were killed uh, by uh, the Germans and lots of people were killed by the, by the Soviets, that in itself doesn't help you explain the Holocaust. Um, that the, it, it doesn't explain the specific animus that the Nazis had against the Jews, I think. So that, of course, lots of people were killed uh, in Europe in, in this period, but to understand why the Nazis, uh, towards the end of the war, went out of their way to round up and deport the Jews of Corfu, or Rhodes, for example, um, or we're still hunting for Jews in the south of France. Um, it's not enough to point to the fact that millions of people were killed in, in Eastern Europe. The numbers, of course, make, um, make the, the small numbers of Jews hunted down elsewhere in Europe seem irrelevant. But for understanding uh, the Nazi plan to eradicate the Jews as such, you can't simply look to uh, the violence that took place in uh, the kind of post-imperial uh, Eastern European space. Um, yeah, I'd agree with Dan. I've nothing much more to add to that. I don't want to break a lance necessarily for, for Snyder, but um, I do recall those parts of the book where he, he describes um, the collaboration on the part of those uh, parts of Eastern Europe that have been occupied by the Soviets. And then when the Nazis took over, um, many or some of those citizens then, of course, who collaborated instantly recognized an opportunity to um, in some way redeem themselves through their anti-Semitism. Uh, so there is some kind of causal nexus in some cases at any rate, but you're absolutely right. That doesn't explain um, the attempt by the Nazis to kill as many Jews as they possibly can by the end of the war, including the Jews of Corfu, which is always that excellent example. So there may be, uh, you can maybe explain how the violence might escalate in some cases or how you might find willing collaboration for the violence and that is certainly there we know that too in the studies of poland recently and also ukraine although i think more needs to be done on the ukraine but none of that explains away this basic attempt on the part of the nazis to carry out the killing of as many jews as they possibly could 
Any other? I, I have very little to add, except that it's an excellent question. It is such an excellent question that I actually had a very similar question on the exam that my students are been writing for the last 24 hours. So I can't say any more about it because it's all a little raw for my poor undergraduates in, in Durham. I should say no more. All right, thank you. All right, I think we have time for maybe one last question from the crowd here. If not, oh, please. Just by way of maybe of a summing up, it's to return to the question about the definition of survivors vis-a-vis uh, -vis kinder transport and, and children or, or, or anyone who escaped as a refugee uh, beforehand. Maybe some final comments from Rebecca on that, please. It's such a big question. I've actually often thought it deserves its own book because there is a history to that definition of survivors that I don't think we've really adequately explored as historians. I think we could do so much more. I remember um, <coughs> digging about, uh, looking at a cache I found somewhere of newspaper articles about this um, big gathering of Holocaust survivors in Washington, DC in, in 1983. And flipping through this, you know, it's just they were sort of reports from the New York Times or something. Um, to publish newspaper reports, but in one of them, the reporter had interviewed the daughter of a survivor who had so she'd come along with her dad to this this thing in 1983, and she was saying, "This is so you know this is such an important experience for him because he's been so ashamed. You know, it's a really bad thing to be a survivor, isn't it? Because everyone's always wondering, what did you do?" to stay alive, right? It, it, this is 1983, so the sort of our current thinking about survivors just wasn't on the table then. And I was so struck by this, I'm not quoting it very well, I wish I could remember exactly, but this, this woman, you know, this young woman who'd come with her concentration camp survivor father to try to help him through the experience of being in this big gathering of survivors, but the way she articulated how it felt to be a survivor that it was a shameful thing and also that there was a you know the kind of public opinion that if you had if you had survived you must have done something wrong in the camps you must have done something bad to survive well we don't have that kind of language anymore to the extent we've forgotten i think that that was once a way of talking and thinking about survivors we've swung in such a different direction that as i was saying at the end of the talk a lot of the child survivors I interviewed all feel very uncomfortable with the way we think about survivors now. They don't want to be put on a pedestal. They don't want their stories to be heartwarming or life affirming. It's their lives, it's their stories. They just want to be treated as, as ordinary humans who went through an extraordinary experience. Um, and I do think actually it would be, and perhaps one day, one of us shall do it, a wonderful book to study the evolution of this term over time, both from the perspective of those who claim the term or feel funny about claiming the term, and from the world around them who judges them, really. Thanks for that. Um, commissioning editors at Yale, I hope you've heard that. Half the room is commissioning editors. <laughs> the room yeah so it just leaves it to me to of course thank our panelists for a fascinating evening i just want to also thank james williams at yale for co-organizing this with me and for conceiving of the of the evening in the first place so thank you and of course thank you to all of you for coming and of course everybody online so thank you thank you